Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to speak. Thank you, Paul, and for um, sustering. Um, and as a London stroke Essex boy, just, just uh, inside the M25, it's great to be here in London. Um, and also great to be talking about stuff in the Midlands and, and, and introducing some of the stuff we're doing in Nottingham. Um, the Murky Waters project, not my name, kind of, it's a great name, Murky Waters, but um, a little bit too negative for, <coughs> sometimes for a, a, an external use. But it is very much about urban water courses and trying to answer the challenge that Richard Defra and society, I guess, is giving us around urban diffuse pollution and water framework directive. Um, targets. It's a two-year programme within the Midlands, Agency, uh, Midlands region of the Environment Agency and we're delivering a range of targeted projects which tackle the causes and consequences of urban diffuse pollution and hopefully we're demonstrating that we are um, answering some of those challenges uh, that Richard and uh, Richard have, uh, have given us. Um, quick range of activities, so it's not all certs, so apologies, but uh, hopefully we recognise them to fit into a bigger picture. So also care on the top left is about Community groups looking after their local water course, that may be about litter collection, it may be about um, misconnections and sewer misuse, all the way through to people who are actually passionate about their water course and want to see people taking a, a more effective catchment approach. And that's a uh, collaboration with Seven Trent and uh, Deep Rick and Tide. And then uh, we've got some volunteering, like that old chap there in his cloth cap um, in Stoke. Um, we've got people in a very urban environment in Leicester um, doing litter collection that, that otherwise wouldn't occur. Um, community, educa uh, community um, education, school education around misconnections, sewer misuse, water, the water cycle in Stoke with groundwork. Um, some community engagement, uh, bottom left, those guys are pretending to be fish um, in Coventry. And some um, urban river restoration. So here we had a pretty deprived water course in Birmingham, which we're trying to restore and, and make it much more natural. I think with all of these, because we have murky uh, community <laughs> element towards this is very important. Um, not just that, but we're trying to push DEFRA's um, message about Love Your River, um, which I think is very important uh, and it's great to see Love Your local watercourse being um, part of the badge that many of us are using when we're working in local watercourse in the fashions. <laughs> so a really uh, eclectic mix, but all of them focused um, on the watercourses and, and water framework directive. But my frustration has been um, and I think this is uh, reflecting from my experiences in America and my reflect reflection on my experiences in the agency for a number of years. <laughs> it's too much of the agency's focus has been on the water course. And here's a, a quite attractive water course, okay, with some um, urban contributions from urban runoff. But too much of our effort is here, both in terms of flood risk and water quality. And we're not taking the catchment approach, which is looking at every one of those gully pots and the community that live around that, so that we, we are reducing. Um, the contributions and, and they could be about, um, as Richard's highlighted, the um, runoff from cars and roadways, but it's also about the way people understand um, flood risk and water quality and the, the way they fit into the wider, wider environment and people taking responsibility for the part they play and also for the risk that they face in terms of flooding. And uh, hopefully, you know, I am trying to look at this approach both in terms of water quality and, and flood risk. So we, um, I was uh, amazed when I mean, we were, um, we had a, an allocation within Murky Waters to spend um, up to a million pound last year and up to 500,000 pound this year. And <coughs> I knew from my time in America that what I wanted to do was to deliver a retrofit sub scheme uh, and a rain garden scheme um, in particular. And to be able to do that going back home um, in Nottingham and being able to do that working with partners was a tremendous privilege. Um, it was a struggle in terms of timescales, um, but hopefully we have, as you can see, um, delivered something which I think is of value and is something that hopefully will be a resource for, for us as a community going forward in terms of the understanding <coughs> effectiveness um, and community support. And we've also proven it's, it's possible. Okay, it costs money, it costs a lot of blood, sweat and tears and collective working, but there you are, we have to fit suds in the ground um, within four months. So it was a collaboration uh, with ourselves, Environment Agency, we, we contributed the funding. Um, Nottingham City Council, who um, I think were incredibly interested in the project, but uh, for them it was kind of landed out of nowhere, and it really took a lot of um, effort them, and I am forever grateful that they were able to help deliver this project um, when it really wasn't, it, was just, it just came out of the balloon for them. And we were working with their highways authority, uh, them as a highway authority. Groundwork Great and Nottingham were our partners, um, we're always very keen to work with the uh, sector to be very much community focused and, and groundwork helped us do that. Um, and Seven Trent Water 
who latterly have come in um, and ran some of the modelling and some of the impact of some of the, the project. So we we started, we knew we wanted to work in, in the Daybook catchment. Daybook is a, I haven't got a, a picture of it, but it's a, a, a typical urban water course, um, very constrained, um, quite literally uh, as an open culvert at, at points. Um, and it was, it's certainly suffering from urban, urban diffuse pollution, so the invert, uh, invertebrates are significantly compressed. Um, and we wanted to work within that pattern close to that and then with a community that, um, for, for whom flooding is real. But not to just, certainly the entire, we must remember the entire focus is, is about water quality, but working sustainably and with communities. But we knew that this community um, were interested in flooding, would be interested in flooding, because they were su suspect, uh, subject to flood risk. So you can see the top left um, picture. Um, it's a day brook. It, it literally falls out of culvert in that top right um, as it comes out under the ring road. Um, this is the first section. Um, significant um, pollution um, from CSOs, but also a, a huge catchment of culverted watercourse, um, and people not even understanding that they are they live close to this uh, this, this brook. Comes out um, in the uh, water meadow, which is the um, the area where you can see day brook written, and uh, Ribblesdale Road just is behind that that water meadow area. And um, my biggest disappointment was that we delivered this in an area where there was already a grass verge. We talked about some of the multiple benefits. I would have much preferred it to be a concrete uh, pavement we were yeah. working with, or maybe stepping into the roadway. Um, but because of constraints in time and utilities, we had, we had to work on a grass verge. To me, um, that's not particularly attractive, um, but uh, it did come to, um, into play some time later when we were talking to the community. But certainly there was an area there we could work and deliver our, our rain gardens. The, um, the road that we were working in had about 60 domestic properties, mostly detached, um, mostly off-street parking, which certainly was a benefit to us. But there was parking concerns in this area, as you see from the yellow line, um, because of the local city hospital. So there's, there was certainly multiple benefits to play for in terms of parking constraints, um, traffic calming, and just an improvement to that local, uh, local uh, streetscape. And this is what we do. You can see that uh, there's snow on the ground. This was being delivered in March as I got uh, more and more concerned we weren't going to deliver this by the end of the year, uh, the financial year. But we delivered 21 rain gardens in that grass verge. Um, here you can see on the left-hand side that we've delivered, um, some of them had the um, perma permavoid, so the milk crate uh, structure within, uh, within the rain garden, beneath the uh, planted uh, material or planted garden. Um, sometimes we're using fill, uh, aggregate fill, and clearly we would have preferred to do much more of the permavoid because of the, the void space, but the cost constraints meant that we couldn't do that in all locations, and also just the uh, constraints around working with utilities meant that sometimes uh, aggregate fill was much more effective. Uh, you can see the inlet uh, to the top right, um, copyright, not quite copyright, but certainly nicked from Owen Davis and Lambeth. Um, and uh, we'll see how that's uh, performing in the, in the slide later, but you know, it really shows that uh, you do need to work to look at the inlet. We did struggle for a long time in terms of understanding how to get water in and out of the, uh, the rain garden, and I think we've designed, with, with Owen's help, uh, something that's, that works and is effective, um, and basically the cobbles there um, aren't just for, to make it look attractive, but are to displace, uh, disperse um, flow and stop erosion in that uh, inlet. Um, interesting um, observation when we were working with the contractors, they really didn't get what we were trying to deliver. Um, the first attempts were very much like uh, a tiling arrangement. So they, they thought they wanted it to be very beautiful and uh, not not uh, not to displace water, but just to look pretty. So we had to get them to, to redesign and re rework some of the inlets. And then uh, in one and soon to be two of the rain gardens, we've got this data logger, and that's showing um, in terms of depth within the void space and um, how much the water is rising or falling um, following the storm events. I certainly wanted to, one of the, the things we wanted to do was sign off the construction process and to see how these performed in terms of the inlets uh, and then in terms of how they um, related, to the, uh, and, uh, related to the flow of water on, with on the road, uh, within the road. Um, I was getting a bit frustrated in terms of how we could get it tested, so I decided to ring 999 and get the fire brigade to come and see the, uh, the fire engine. No, uh, uh, asked my friends in Nottingham uh, Fire and Rescue, Nottinghamshire Fire and Rescue, they came and brought an appliance and, recreated rainfall and I'm sure many of you people if not all of you have seen the video to see how the inlet works but here's a still from the video so just to show how rain um, 
think you did a very good job. Rain fell on the road and then found its way into the rain garden. And here's some of the graphs uh, we've been able to um, obtain, and from the data we've been able to obtain from that data log. Now, we must remember this is about water quality. The, the, the challenge is to get some water quality data from these, from these rain gardens. But actually, I don't think that's the most important thing. We've already seen and talked about the sort of contaminants that come from urban runoff, <coughs> from highways. And I think capturing that first flush and dealing with the volumes of water are the most important thing, which is what we talked about um, the benefits of green studs um, rather than um, engineering solutions for, for managing the surface water volumes. And again, these are doing just that. So you can see in the fire service baptism, um, but also in the first storm event just a few days later, that the water finds its way very quickly into the inlet. Um, we get a very quick and steep rise as water fills a void space, and then that's, as that's allowed to um, disperse into the, into the ground, so we were able to use a, a, a locate this in permeable ground. Um, we see the rise and fall of water. So all of that water that's found its way into that void space is taken out of the system, never finds its way to the water course. And I think that's important in terms of flood risk, but also we can talk about a little bit about water quality. Seven Trent and their um, contractors, Michelle, have also done some work, and this is the first step in terms of modeling of the uh, system and there's more to come. But this shows that in one, in one year storm, we're seeing a reduction in 33% of the volume of water reaching the sewer. So that again is all water that's taken out of the uh, sewer downstream and won't find its way to the river. And I think the, or, or the book, and I think the important thing to, to mention here is not just is that capturing water that would include contaminants, but we're preventing some of the impact of that huge flush, that huge flashy system on the water course. Um, uplifting all that uh, contaminated sediment, um, preventing um, sustainable, sustained growth within that river. So we're, we're making that system much less flashy. I think that will have benefits uh, longer term too. In terms of water quality, so this is my slide. I'm, I'm more than happy to be challenged, and I think this is ongoing work. Uh, we're having a meeting with uh, Nottingham City, uh, sorry, Nottingham University next month. For me, this is about Two things. One is that uh, we're looking at first flush, so we're capturing the first flush, flush. I think here's a demonstration of how those inlets are working. This is material that would otherwise find its way into the gully pot. It would include those, the dog poo, it would include the litter, and, um, and these have become uh, um, resting places of litter. Um, it would also include the, the contaminants bound to the solids. So I think this shows that the rain gardens are working. They are capturing that as water is allowed to settle in the inlets. Um, and then water is being treated within the rain gardens, within the uh, organic features of grass species. Um, so for me, it is capturing the, that first flush is important. So it's not just for the big events, but it's also that cleansing of water, cleansing of the road that would occur for all those smaller events <coughs> that would otherwise find their way straight to the gully pot and potentially either sit there to be left, uh, to be washed out by the next big storm, or that would find their way to the water course anyway. So first flush is what is key to me. Um, <coughs> We do need to do, I think, some work to, to prove the water quality benefits. But here, we might not just, just might not be in the location. Um, the, to show that the, the function of the um, rain gardens, we've not changed the highway drainage at all. So when the water fills up um, and, and um, overfills the, the rain gardens, the, the water is allowed then just to run back into the gully pots. So it's very difficult to do a um, sort of downstream sample like we've seen at Mango. What about the community? So I think this is the other element to this. Um, we were very keen to look at um, suds and rain gardens as a way to engage people. So we've talked about um, pipe work and about cars, but we've not talked about people putting oil down gully pots, we've not talked talk, talk about plasters or painters disposing their material down gully pots, and we've not talked about misconnections. And they are all important elements of, mis of urban diffuse pollution. And I wanted to be, um, use this as an engagement activity, to talk about rain gardens and their place in preventing water pollution, but also to allow people to begin to understand their place in their local catchment. So how they ran their house, how they behaved, and the impacts that that had um, on downstream water course. And we also, I want to be very honest and candid about some of the issues that that's raising. 
So we have certainly had a range of views expressed. So I'm absolutely <coughs> delighted. I met to the lady that said that on uh, Friday, and she couldn't be happy about the rain gardeners outside her house. Absolutely um, <laughs> delighted. Literally, that's what it says. To someone who said it's was a complete waste of money. And we've had some really candid views. Um, so, for example, people suggesting, why should I have my parking space removed to stop water pollution or to stop uh, downstream flooding? You know, not any sense of place or any sense of community which was incredibly frustrating actually, um, I guess as a human, to think that someone doesn't want to have a bit of grass verge removed um, to stop downstream flooding. Um, some, some residents were supportive from the start, from the very beginning they understood the, 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 uh, the, the concept, the, the purpose, the issues around um, driveway uh, and uh, loss of um, permeable ground within our urban areas. And, then, and again, I spoke to another lady, she was said that she used to live on the, water, on the road and she saw that she wanted to understand this and she instantly got it, instantly understood the place that this, the role that this would uh, play in that catchment. But it doesn't work for everyone and I think we've also demonstrated and we've talked about, I think we've talked about Land Rover, not everyone gets this, certainly not everyone gets um, the rain gardens. Even people that have lived in that location for a long period of time understood the fl flood risk. If they don't necessarily get it or if they've lost their parking space or if they don't like grass species as one said, they won't get it and they won't understand the bigger picture. So we have a tremendous range. Um, but I think what we, we are showing is that we do need to use these opportunities to reinforce the place that communities have in terms of urban diffuse pollution. So you'll see from the signs, the signs say, Daybrook starts here. It's to reinforce the point that the brook starts at your doorstep. And that works, I think, in both in terms of water quality, in terms of the way people uh, live their life, where they wash their cars, <coughs> their mini bins, um, but also the way that um, people respond to flood risk. So it's not just somebody else's problem or it's not the agency's fault. It, people need to really take some responsibility for the, uh, the way that they sit within that catchment. And it, we've certainly seen that it has reinforced that connection between the street and the brook. And most importantly, I think we are setting up the Friends of Day Brook and we see that that community engagement, that community ownership will be the secure the long-term legacy. So for example, some of those residents are now tending the rain gardens. Um, certainly we've seen some people, it, it, it certainly, we've, we've had comments that actually this is where the kids drop the litter. Now whether that's because people specifically drop it there or whether it's where litter is found, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. But I can see that some people could see that grass verge and drop some litter. But we've seen people tend that rain garden and I understand the place that that is um, the, the purpose and want to look after it. And hopefully we'll uh, see more of that as the friend of their group and as, as sorry, friends of Dave Brook, and the residents have a strong affinity with this, uh, with this feature. Just uh, as an aside to look at, to, 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 to look at community, one thing is to show mm -hmm. that they don't necessarily work in all storm events. So um, you'll see this is a Ribbles Dale Road. Interestingly, look at this is a, a one of the summer storms. Um, interestingly, some people looking at that say the Ribbles Dale Road haven't, haven't seen flooding in 50 years. I was a gentleman that said that just the other day, and just down the road, about 50 metres down the road, this is what his neighbours live with. So, you know, again, this sense of place is not necessarily people, something that everyone understands. Um, but people at number 57, I said that because you can see the, um, the gate says 57, they think this is one of these people that think it's the biggest waste of time. Mm. Um, and they were particularly um, delighted to see one of the roads, uh, uh, some of the drain gardens being affected by flood risk um, and some of the impact it was having, I think it was a plant um, flowing downstream. But, you know, in reality, this was part of the problem. We were talking about the holistic approach, we were talking about the issues in terms of flood risk and water quality, and then we had a huge storm event. Now, we saw the grass, we know these were functioning, but unfortunately people thought it would solve all flooding on, on the road and, and therefore be effective. Um, but it just has a small impact certainly in terms of the wider catchment, but I believe would have had a significant impact just to introduce that permeable area within the, um, within the landscape. Facts and figures, so 20 rain gardens were constructed. They were designed to capture surface water from one in 30 year storm event from 5,500 metres square of a total of 7,100 metres square of the road. The cost was 77,000. Um, I've seen some raised eyebrows, and I think that's right that we are transparent about those costs. I think you know we have some issues around procurement. You know, we spent about ten grand on uh, the permavoid, which is a lot of money to be spending, 
Um, but that's perhaps because of the fact it's a retrofit uh, nature and not a massive scheme. In terms of challenges, there were certainly time, time, tight time scales. We delivered this in four months, um, and we were retrofitting something new for the local community and for the people who were involved in the project. Contractor buying and understanding was absolutely an issue, unfortunately. You know, they, I remember they, they must have constructed three or four of them, and they said to us, um, we don't understand why the rain garden has sunk the pavement area. You know, is, is this right? You know, and they were constructing rain gardens. That was a frustration. Community engagement, we did have a letter that said we need to save our grass verges. There's not an awful lot you can do about that. Certainly people don't like change, but certainly we have heard people saying that um, the, the grass verges are part of this, the nature of this road. They were designed in the 30s, constructed in the 30s, and grass verges is what we should see, not these new exotic things you call rain gardens. And safety concerns, we've, we've certainly had some individuals who have said that um, cyclists could fall into this, blind people could fall into this, or drunk people could fall into this. Sure. And I think we need to be realistic about this. You know, it's a change in the look and feel of a street. I don't think it's a significant change. You know, the drop is no different to a curb, but it's a change, and we have to appreciate that when, when, when working with communities. In terms of next steps, and this is another opportunity for getting some water quality monitoring. Um, so this was part of the Merkin Waters Programme, which is a two-year programme. This year we've been working with Groundwork, Sir Trent and Nottingham City. Two minutes, thank you, perfect timing. Um, and this is where we're going to intercept a surface water sewer that comes in, um, you can see the road that comes in about halfway up on the left-hand side, and comes into this park, Lincoln Street Park, intercept that surface <coughs> water sewer that um, currently goes directly into the uh, River Lean, put it through a wetland, which will, uh, rebuild wetland, which will certainly allow us to um, look at the impacts of water quality, but what we're not seeing in either of these projects is the treatment of terrain, and I accept that that's what we should see, but we're, we're using here public green space to improve, enhance habitat, and see how uh, weed beds and wetland feature can, can treat water quality. And there's a the scheme. So it's quite a small catchment, which is great, um, quite a mixed rural, oh, sorry, domestic and industrial setting, but currently just directly via seven trend sewer into the uh, river link. And as I say, we're going to provide a bit of storage, a bit of abatement, um, and a reed bed. And then finally, <coughs> like just, to, to, just to prove hopefully that this is about water quality, a plug for the new Healthy River Code, which we've introduced um, as part of Murky Waters. And I think this, is start, this proves that it isn't just about putting suds in place, it is about reinforcing that, those messages with the community so they understand but they've got to look out for misconnections. They shouldn't pour oil down their drains. It is only uh, rain down the drain. And even use of garden products or fertilizer, for example, on the roads. We can't expect suds to do everything. We all need to change behaviours and uh, hopefully bring about some benefits for the water course. Thank you very much. <coughs>